Okay, thanks for coming on the show today, Casey. Really appreciate it. Yeah, I'm excited to be on, Mark. Thanks for having me. Okay, uh, I'll just try and do a quick introduction. So, sure. K- Casey, uh, the, the link is really with Paul Cummins, who was on episode four. Yep. Uh, so we, we'll explain a bit more about that. But it's essentially, Paul stayed in a, a guest family when he was at Ravenscroft in Raleigh in North Carolina. And you were the youngest brother. I think you were the only brother, Kev. Yeah, I have an older brother, Kev. I have a younger brother, Alex, as well. So I'm the middle one. Okay. And, and I mean, I was just saying it's crazy how basketball can bring people together because we definitely wouldn't be talking. That's yeah. right. That's it's right. Absolutely crazy. So I think that's amazing to start off with. Uh, and the other thing was, um, Paul explained that you were, uh, uh, you ended up walking onto the Duke team, which is something that I'd love to chat to you about. Yeah. A good few, a good few questions there. Uh, sure. and, and you still seem to have an involvement with basketball. So I'd like to talk to you about kind of what you do now as well. Yeah, definitely. So that's cool. So let's start with, uh, okay. And also the other thing is you have a baby on the way. So you may have to run yeah. off in the middle of this yeah. podcast. By the, way, by the way, if I have to uh, jump, you know, you know why. I might have to leave early. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we, baby on the way. So we, we might have our first live birthing on. on uh, <laughs> that's true. <right. laughs> yeah. That'll be a first. Uh, yeah, okay, so so let's jump into it. So we go to start off with Ravenscroft because that's the high school that you attended and yeah. all attended. So we have a little bit of information on that. But um, I mean, the first thing that came to my head when I was thinking about this was, uh, and I don't know if this is normal, uh, but like you, when you first heard that there was uh, this Irish guy coming up to turn up to your house, I think he was there for four years, right? I mean, what, what were you thinking? Were you thinking like, great, or like, oh, this is, I, I'm not really keen on this or is this was the first time it had happened for your household yeah yeah it was definitely the first time it's a good question um (laughs) you know it wasn't like exactly uh you know really normal um at at Ravenscroft where you know there was a lot of exchange students or anything like that there were a few but um no and my family I guess told us we're all ecstatic I mean it was a kid from Ireland and uh you know he's coming over to the States and, uh, you know, wants to play basketball. That's his ultimate dream. So um, I was ecstatic about it. And I still remember the day uh, when he and his family came and they were awesome. I mean, the, his parents, Tempe and Jer, just, you know, great folks. And um, I can't remember if his sister Gail was there or not at first uh, meeting, but um, it was seamless. I mean, the transition was unbelievable. Paul, fit right into our family. And even to this day, you know, I still consider him a brother. Um, he was in my wedding. Uh, so uh, we're extremely close and it was an incredible, he's, he lived with us for two years. Um, so uh, he came his junior and senior year of, of high school uh, in the States. And so, um, yeah, it was, you know, I, it was a little bit surprising, I guess, to answer your question, but um, no, we were ecstatic about it. And, you know, thank God that uh, he came into our life because, uh, you know, it was uh, brought, brought us here, right, Mark? So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so the podcast. But, uh, yeah, no, to this day, he's, we still talk very frequently. I still consider him family. So that's cool. That's amazing. Um, so, yeah. So what was living with Paul like? Just, just like a quick, quick overview. Cause I mean, obviously a lot of people in Irish basketball certainly would know Paul because he played sure. at a high level underage. He was a pretty high profile player at the time. Uh, and he started the SD Academy, which you've gone to, and we can chat about right. it in a little bit. Um, yeah. And he's pretty squeaky clean, but was there anything like any annoying stuff, like any any horror stories about Paul? Nothing too bad, obviously, but you know, like any annoying habits? What was his most annoying habits? Nothing, no annoying habits. <laughs> um, no, he was an incredible older brother for me. I have an older brother, Kev, who was also, I mean, I, I'm lucky. Um, little brother, Alex, too. So, uh, but Paul actually was in the room right across the hallway from me. So I would, you know, I was, I'm five years younger. So I would be doing my homework. I would decide to take a break and go over and knock on his door. And, you know, he'd be playing the guitar, which he's, he's unbelievable at. And, or go outside, shoot hoops, you know, talk about girls or whatever, you know, just typical, uh, you know, young, young guy stuff. But, um, no, he was, he was incredible. Uh, one funny story, though, is uh, the his appetite, Kevin's appetite, my appetite, Alex's appetite were just all huge. But Paul takes the cake. I mean, he's <laughs> he could eat a whole cow and still be hungry, you know, two hours later. So at that time, you know, my mom 
love her to death, you know, she would be going through a loaf of bread a day, right? <laughs> a whole loaf of bread. There was one time where she had, I think it was uh, two pork tenderloins for dinner that night. We ate very well growing up. Two pork tenderloins. Uh, she was preparing them. You know, it was going to be for dinner after uh, a soccer game. So Kevin and Paul played on the Ravenscroft soccer team together. Before the game, Paul came home to have a snack. Uh, well, that snack was one of the tenderloins <laughs> for a game. So my mom was pissed off at him that later that night, you know, she had to feed the family with one tenderloin and Paul can, you know, make a cheese sandwich or whatever. So <laughs> just the, looking back, like the tubs of ice cream, the amount of bread, uh, the grocery bill was high. I'll put it out. <laughs> so there's only flowers that he had too much. I mean, it's, it's, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you can't fault them. We were all growing boys at that time, but, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we put away some food there's no question about that yeah i think that's a garden variety problem for for most uh you know mothers with with <laughs> young men particularly in the house that they just eat you out of house and home is the expression i guess they use yeah. Yeah. especially <laughs> the ones who are burning calories like we were back then back then just practices every day and games and all that so yeah and it doesn't matter how kind of skinny you are you can just burn oh. the calories your metabolism yeah. just just gets through it. That's yep, a good right. story. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, the, one of the things Paul told me to talk about was the the um, the basketball or the the rivalry that the, the high school team had with them, the Cardinals, uh, the, the Gibbons, yeah, which is Mon Gibbons. the Gibbons. Uh -huh. Isn't a Gibbon a, a monkey? I'm pretty sure it's like a, a Gibbon, like is like a. A monkey, right? It's like the well, I, I'm not sure, but Car Carl Gibbons is, uh, they were our crosstown rival growing up. I mean, they were, and those games were um, jam-packed. I mean, so the for the varsity uh, boys basketball team, it was always the last game. So it was always at like 7.30 at night. Um, and oftentimes the gym was already filled up by the JV boy, the junior varsity boys game, which was typically at five. Um, so that was always a huge game. Unfortunately, it's not the same rivalry today as it once was. Um, but those games were insane. Uh, just f filled, loud, uh, heated rivalry, chance the whole, the whole time. Um, when I was playing in high school, Gibbons was always a big game. Um, but then there was another school uh, across Raleigh called Word of God Academy. They had John Wall. Oh, well, wow. okay. A guy named CJ Leslie, who ended up playing at North Carolina State and played in the G League for a bit. And a guy named Desmond Wells, uh, who originally went to Xavier and then he transferred to Maryland. And I, I think he's still playing over in, in Europe somewhere. Just an unbelievable – that – that whole gym was filled up by 3:45 in the afternoon. Um, just ridiculous. So we've, we're lucky. I mean, it, we had some good crowds uh, and it filled up pretty quickly, but those, those Gibbons games were always a fierce rivalry. Yeah. The, the, um, I remember just even, even the hype around John Wall, even at high school level. I mean, oh. I was getting sent clips of this guy and he just huge amount of hype. Like one oh, yeah. from a high school player perspective, one of the oh, it's unreal. The I'm a year older than him, so that's what like his junior year was right when he was starting to get you know attention notoriety around the country, and yeah. I'm sure Ravenscroft is in some of those clips that you've seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because uh, he he was just dunking everything, and right. I, he, he didn't seem to quite do as much of that when he kind of got to the NBA actually I noticed but then at high school level it's it's probably easy there's less athletes there to kind of contest and, and right you know, what, and, what was amazing about him that has translated to the next level even still is his speed with the ball yeah I mean he's just just so fast so you know he's a north south runner um but just so fast and you know he's big uh but yeah he'll still he'll still punch it on someone uh no matter yeah. what at any level but especially in high school it was uh, more frequent <laughs> yeah i mean everything i was seeing he was he was as you say punching everything he, it, oh, even yeah. in nba he'll still you're right he'll still come down and jump off his off leg and 
like dunk it on yeah, anyone really. And you're right, his his speed has is still impressive in the NBA, which is yeah. saying something. It's unreal. It's unreal. Yeah. You know, he isn't he's been hurt for a long time, but from what I've read, what I've heard, he's you know rehab pretty extensively, um, and he's ready to go. So it'll be fun to see him back out on the court. Yeah, I saw him on a podcast. He was talking lots of stuff. <laughs> he, he's always talk stuff. I'll tell you he, that. He, he's talking he lots of stuff. Talk about smack. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other guy, the other two guys. I think it was. It's quite. A, it was one of the most popular podcasts. Um, I've forgotten the names of the two NBA players now. Uh, Matt Barnes and uh, Jackson. Uh, Stephen Jackson. Stephen Jackson. Yeah. That's the one. And, and they were just like, mm-hmm. And he was just talking, 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 talking. He kept going. Yeah. yeah. He, he was yeah, well we, so he, John, uh, so in our games were so big, because I forgot to mention Ravenscroft, we had Ryan Kelly. So Ryan Kelly, who played for the Lakers, played at Duke. Play for the Lakers, the Hawks. Now he's playing uh, overseas and in, in Japan. But um, you know he's he was unreal in high school too. And John and him actually played travel basketball together. So they were like the Stockton Malone of their you know travel team. The AAU okay, team. right. So so the, so the AAU is then it'll be they'll take the best players from maybe those two high schools if they're the two big ones, and then they'll just go do the travel thing. So. Yeah, it's you know. Um, more or less, yeah. There's a few teams, um, and it keeps growing every year. But there's a few teams in the area, and North Carolina is a very big basketball state. I mean, there's like Chris Paul, you know, grew up in Winston Salem, which is an hour and a half away. It's the Curry brothers, Steph and Seth, I played against them in high school. Um, it does know, seem so to be. It does seem to be like a like a. Yeah, like a, like a hot spot for. I mean, obviously, you get, obviously North Carolina, and then you got yeah. like obviously Jordan went there and stuff like that. But there seems to be a lot of basketball around there. It's obviously the you know the oh, te- in the south, like places like Texas might say football is almost more popular. Definitely basketball is the right, definitely basketball. And part of that is because of Duke in North Carolina, North Carolina State. I mean, it's just entrenched in the fabric uh, mm. of North Carolina sports. So. They're quite close. I just looked on the map before I came on there, and I was like, they're literally right beside each other. I mean, Ten, ten miles. Crazy. That's so well, crazy. I, I, I forgot that I'm on an uh, Irish basketball podcast. i got, I got to say it in meters. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do the so, conversion for everybody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay, that's interesting just to hear about the, the rivalry. Um, he, he also mentioned about the soccer, but I, I mean – interesting did you have a particularly strong soccer team in, in Ravenscroft? yeah, okay. yeah we, did. we did we were well coached too a guy named marlo campbell and a, another guy named kevin scott um yeah we're good and my my brother kevin he he was really good he he ended up playing collegiately at duke and then another guy named nick kuklinski who for paul's first like three or four months when he came over to the stage he actually, he actually lived with nick's family Nick played at Indiana University, um, which is considered like, you know, the UCLA of college soccer, like, you know, what UCLA basketball is. Um, So, and then Paul came over and Paul, you know, hopefully he doesn't sell himself short. He was a heck of a soccer player. Um, I heard that he only used his head. That's not true at all. I mean, he was was pretty good. Um, He was very good, I should say, but they were, they made it to the state finals and lost in the state finals. And, um, you know, it was pretty, again, people think about American soccer and think that we trip over ourselves when that happens, uh, whenever we get a soccer ball on the field, but, (laughs) you know, it was pretty high level and it was, uh, it was, you know, they were, they were very good. And I grew up playing too. So. Yeah. I mean, like, look, they, they did pretty well in the last world cup. It's they're catching up for sure. Like it's not, it's a bit like European basketball, is kind of catching up. People are not t- looking at America going, they can't play anymore. And it's definitely, right. it's earned no, some it's, respect. It's an interesting point um, because I think with European basketball, you know, it and U.S. soccer, it's just got a later start, right, compared to, you know, yeah. U.S. basketball or European soccer, South American soccer. Um, mm, yeah. Sometimes it, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, it just, you got to continue to build culture and, um you know, keep building year after year. So, yeah, it, it kind of depends on the next the next generation what they're starting to play, what becomes popular with the next generation, and 
how I guess the international team can affect that and how well they do perform. So probably the fact that the US have done better in more recent years is probably means that more kids are playing it. And right. They brought a lot of high profile players over to the US, like Beckham and those guys. So that'll probably help the game grow as well. Yeah, it's helped. Unfortunately, they lot they were uh, left out of the uh, 2018 World Cup, which was just uh, yeah, that's total right. regression from from what they were doing. But I still think uh, they're making progress over. Now the women's team, they're the gold standard. Uh, yeah, <laughs> part yeah, of that is because right. Americans, you know, made it okay for women to to play soccer at an earlier age. So I think that's where they have an advantage over the rest of the world. Yeah, that's true. Because that, it, it's still kind of a, a growing, the women, women's soccer is still growing at the moment, I guess, in terms of the profile yeah. of the game as well. No doubt. No okay, doubt. That, that, that's interesting. Um, the, okay, so, so the, next, the next thing I'd really love to hear about is so you, the, the Duke experience. Uh, tell yeah. me how that all started. and Because and, Paul didn't explain to me, he just said that that'd be a good yeah. point to talk about. So. Well, um, so, uh, you know, we moved to Raleigh, North Carolina when I was younger, um, and Raleigh is 30 minutes away from Durham. My dad went to Duke, and ah, so okay. he and my uncle went to Duke. So they're the first in our families to go. So naturally, you know, you're going to raise your kid to be a Duke fan, especially if you live in close proximity to that university. Um, so I was lucky enough, and my brother Kevin, uh, we were lucky enough to go to games with my dad, you know, from a young age, um, and just see, you know, the 2001 national championship team with Jason Williams, Mike Dunleavy, Shane Battier, Boozer, Boozer, yeah, um, Redick, you know, JJ Redick, uh, wow. him running off screen. So when you're in it and you're at Cameron Indoor Stadium, and you have a love for basketball it's hard not to just fall in love with the program um so that's how it all started i mean that's just my dad getting us introduced to it and then from there you know when i was in high school um the thought of playing basketball or playing soccer at the next level definitely crossed my mind and um you know i was a good player but i was probably i would have probably had to you know, play at like a low division one level, maybe, you know, if I was lucky, but I got an early to Duke. And so that I got an early my senior year and that was my decision. So from there, you know, that the Duke coaching staff during that time, they were also recruiting Ryan Kelly, who was a year younger than me. So I got to know the staff pretty well. Um, Paul gives me too much credit in that I walked on. Not quite. Uh, I was actually a student manager, so I was very much involved in practice and involved every day in drills and even individual workouts. So, you know, trying to guard the likes of Seth Curry, which I did in high school. He torched me one time, um, but uh, held him to six points one year. But anyway, (laughs) but in practice, guarding the likes of Austin Rivers, Kyrie Irving, Seth Curry, Nolan Smith, John Shire, Kyle Singler, like all these guys. Um, And that was my, that was during college. That was my college years of, you know, being involved in practice, being involved with the staff in terms of helping with scouting and all that. So long story short, I graduated, I expressed an interest to the staff that I'd like to get involved in coaching. And so they put me in a role where I was doing some of the operations of the program, um, but also some of the video and cutting up film and preparing scouting reports and all that. Um, So it led me to being a director of ops. And then, you know, it was a lifelong dream for me. I was sitting, you know, on a bench, on the bench, two seats down from, arguably the greatest coach of all time. Yeah, that's um, crazy. That's uh, such a- it was incredible. And being in staff meetings until, you know, three in the morning, watching film and, um, you know, it was incredible. It was an unbelievable experience. I realized quickly that uh, 
I wasn't as dedicated to being a coach as I wanted to be. <laughs> so I actually got out of it, um, which I'm grateful for, but still the, the experience of it all is, I would never change a thing. I mean, it was unbelievable. So very grateful okay. for it. Okay. That's, that's interesting. I've got a few questions on, on just the staff. Yeah. And yeah. Fire away. Co coach Krzyzewski. It's funny when you write out his name, it doesn't phonetically read how you would, <laughs> yeah, I, cool. I mean, I've, I've seen it written down, but when I wrote it out here on the page, I was like, that definitely looks like it says Krzyzewski yeah. or something like that. Be another vowel in there, should <laughs> yeah. Um, so that, that's, that's a really interesting story. How you just kind of, it almost just, I wouldn't say it fell into it, but like you kind of just like, it just naturally happened. And then you just, you kind of, you had an experience there and that you actually came out the back of it and decided that it wasn't for you, even though a lot of people would just maybe cling on to that, that kind of, yeah. you know what I mean? Cause you could quite easily do that. No, no question. I was just no looking question. up coach K cause coach, coach K is kind of special in his own right. I was looking up some of the, so he's 40th season at Duke, which is incredible. That, that, that's incredible. incredible in itself. <laughs> Five national championships. And then he, he's got, they talked about the, oh yeah, the three, three Olympic gold medals as well, which is yeah. incredible as well. I yeah. mean, that, that, that Redeem team, the fact that they were recruited them in to, to get the U.S. basketball team, which is, you know, without question, um, you know, over the years, the, the best team in the world of, of basketball, and they've assembled incredible teams, including the Dream Team. The fact that they got Mike Krzyzewski to come in and take that team is a testament to just how detail orientated and how good a leader he is because oh, yeah. because the guys on that on that team if you look at the the lineup on that team i mean they arguably could rival the actual dream team when you look at the the, 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 talent. the, the talent you right. had that crazy draft where you had uh, carmelo and Dwayne wade and, and right. lebron right. Yeah, yeah. the guys like Dar darren williams and just i was i even had some older guys jason kidd was on that team as well Jason kidd i mean kobe Kobe, Kobe was yeah, and, and and I think I read I read something when I was reading there. I was mean, just waiting for you to come on. I was reading about the team, and they were saying that uh, Coach K said, you know, R.I.P. Kobe, but like he said, Kobe was the, the kind of guy that he leaned on in terms of bringing the team together, oh, all yeah. those leaders together. He he leaned on him to set the tone because he know he knew about going in. He knew about his work ethic. So, like, yeah. the way Coach would talk about it is that they would have, with Team USA, they'd have segmented times for practice, but then they would have to leave blocks of time in the morning, the afternoon, the, and the evening for those guys to go, you know, work out on their own. And all of them did that. Kobe did it every, every, every session day. that he had available, he would take advantage of. Incredible. And that's how obsessed he was with his craft. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, seeing that and intentionally leaving those blocks open and communicating that to the rest of the team, seeing how Kobe did it, those other guys said, "Well, if he's gonna do it, then we got to do it too." Like just leading by example, so. leading by example, and kind of setting a tone for the rest of the team. Right. And and given that they're so competitive, it's a very smart thing to do because it'll goad them into kind of doing the same thing and and. Question. Applying that, yeah, he's quite smart. Yeah, <laughs> clearly, there's a reason for that. There, there was something there. The, the Duke, had the most hated team in college basketball, is that because of the success they've had? I'm, I'm assuming. I'm really Hundred percent. Right, because that there's no other reason why you would hate them so much, but that they're so successful and yeah, um, just having the equivalent. Um, right, um, it's almost like the New York Yankees, or you know, it's just like the, the teams that have success. Yeah. And they, you know, there's probably other reasons why, right? But um, yeah, there's a reason behind that. Yeah, the, it, it's similar situation to I. You probably I don't know if you've come over and watched any Gaelic football, but Dublin at the moment have been dominating for the last ten years, and maybe because it's the capital, and maybe because they're a bit arrogant and they've won so much. I shouldn't say arrogant because I'm living well, in Dublin. No, I think that's. I think that's accurate. I think there's a bit of arrogance, right, with Duke. Right. And, this is prestigious university and this yeah. ac academic university. And there's so many other, you know, so many yeah. moving parts at all, but yeah, there might be uh, a perception that, that they think they're more uh, uh, elite or, or, or 
a, sure. Yeah, so not superior. Superior probably the wrong word, but like that they think they're that they think they're better than everyone, but actually maybe that's not the case. But from the outside looking in, you know, that's a kind of almost a grudge match straight away from yeah. your own head because you want to beat those yeah. guys. That seems right. to be yeah. Just from watching some of the college basketball, that's the sense I got from it. So yeah, it was interesting to see but that. That's accurate. <laughs> And there was something else there, and again, this is something where I was reading on the same article. They were saying, why do they think some of the, and this might be again going to coach, talking about Coach K again, is why do they think some of the guys in Duke didn't end up like being as as good in the NBA as you might have thought they would be given how good they were in Duke and how successful Duke are? And there was a couple of hypotheses thrown out as to why that was. Um I, they mentioned like a guy like John Shire or Singler, who's been in the NBA and, and he's, yeah. he's gone back and forth to Spain. And they yeah. were saying things like because he brings out the, the best in them, they almost overachieve yeah. in Duke. And then they go to the NBA, it's like they don't have the same inspiration at that level. And you yeah. kind of have to push yourself more and stuff like that. So maybe there was just a bit of that. I yeah, maybe. I mean, I, I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. I mean, you probably. You take all the blue bloods of college basketball, you could probably point that out for, for every program. It's just, you know, it's just so hard to make the NBA, you know, it's so hard to play professionally. um, Even if you go to a place like Duke, but I think there's some accuracy to that. I mean, with, um, you know, the John Shires of the world who he, to this day, he remains a close friend of mine. He, um, you know, maybe it's maybe it's because they will never have a coach again that can pull out the best of them. But John, another thing too is that for if we're looking at him specifically, he had he suffered a really big time injury to his eye. And he's oh, yeah. legally blind in his right eye. It was in summer league ball uh, right after he graduated. Um, I remember him in the summer league actually because I, yeah. I started watching was, the summer league around that time. Yeah, he was close to signing a deal with the Heat and suffered a bad bad eye injury that um still affects him to this day but wow. okay. there's some accuracy to that but i think you could say that really i don't think that's just for duke i think that could be like any blue blood program it's so hard to play at that next level yeah and you see so many players that that are you know some of the best players in college basketball that that can drop out of the league quick and quickly yeah i think me and paul talked about it there's 300 400 i think it's actually maybe 400 and then you've got so much European talent now. There's, there's, it's 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 basically you might as well be trying to win the lottery. At, you know oh, I, mean? I know. It's some um, you have a better chance. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like it's it's not like it's it's a it's an easy thing or a given, it, even if you're at a top college in, in, in right. the US, which is it just shows you how difficult it is to kind of make it. At that no level. question. No question. And a guy yeah. like Carl Singler, I mean he. You know, he signed a five-year, twenty-five million dollar deal. Uh, That's he's, okay. He's he actually did, he he uh, hung up his shoes. He's done now. Um, ah, right. Okay. But uh, I know I had a good career in Spain and uh, and all that. But yeah, it's an interesting. It is an interesting point for sure. Yeah, I mean, like the the thing is, maybe the type of athlete that they recruited Duke is different to the to some of the guys that they recruit in other colleges. I mean, if you look at Maybe Kansas, they look at they're always recruiting more, more athletic types. So it's just maybe he's looking for more team-oriented players. And when they go to the NBA, they, you know, there's there's probably many variables that you could look at. There's, I, I just wanted to see what your thoughts are on that anyway, because yeah. I just read the article before I came on, so I just thought. Yeah, so, yeah. and certainly the landscape is has changed too. I think just because of, uh, you know, we're now in this one and done era of college basketball a lot of that has to do with the fact that you know in the nba you can't you can't be 18 like you got to be either 19 or play in one year of college you're seeing a lot of kids nowadays taking that one year to play overseas and make money while they're at it um mm, that, that's true yeah that is so true it's, actually it's definitely changed and i think uh you know how you recruit or the types of kids that you recruit and you got to adapt to what the game is lending, uh, you know, itself to. So, mm. but there's ions and the RJ Barrett's of the world and, um, you know, are, are going to Duke now because they want to be coached by the greatest. <laughs> That's true. That, that, and that had, that kind of changed things and that might change the type of, 
you know, or how maybe younger players who are going to college who are stars, you know, they might consider like, okay, well, these guys went to Duke and they've gone on and played in the NBA now. So it might change the type of athlete that Duke is getting maybe in the future. No no okay, question. that's true. Yeah, I never thought about that. Um, okay, speaking of one year, one and done, uh, it's a good segue to Kyrie. So I, I think Paul said to mention Kyrie because Kyrie was there. I looked yeah. at it, he played seven, uh, sorry, 11 games. 11 games. He averaged 17 points per game and 4.3 yep. assists. Yep. Um, I have a question on him about the NBA as well, actually. But sure. uh, did, so you, you were there when Kyrie was there? Yep. So he he was a freshman when I was a senior, or uh, when I was a junior. I, I got I'm older than him by two years. Okay, cool, cool. Um, and, and did you kind of because uh, he, he's an exceptional talent, as far as I'm concerned. Like he's he's um, he's one of these guys that you know even, even I there's a video of Kobe and him on on the US team, and you can even see that Kobe was like he he kind of tagged him as the next you know you know the, the next guy in the NBA coming up. Yeah. It's probably, I would say, it's arguably ended up being maybe Steph Curry's outshined him and taken his star a little bit. I would say, and Kyrie um, never has quite found a good fit at the NBA level. And I wanted to get your thoughts on why maybe Kyrie, how, from what you've experienced with him, how come he hasn't found that team? It's probably could be just luck, or do you know? If, do you think there's anything there in in the way he plays, or that how his his mindset is? Yeah, um, you know, it's it's tough. I just comparing to what I know about him from college, it's probably a tough question to to give a truthful uh answer on, but um first off, side story, just you said exceptional talent, like the most exceptional talent I've seen in person. I mean, he's wow. And if you look at like clips of him from his freshman year at Duke, you could tell he's young. Right, like in his face, you could tell like physically he's still he's not fully developed. Uh, yeah. But just yeah. Yeah. Un- like the handle that was always there. And his ability to make layups and create shots and um I remember one practice he you know, we're working on ball screen defense. Right. Not exactly the most fun thing to work on, however, it's an important part of defending, especially in today's game, because there's so many ball screens. Well, it requires, you know, a ball handler, a screener, and then the big who's defending that screener to either hedge and show or to to zone up or to switch or whatever it is. So we're trying to go through this drill, but Kyrie's the ball handler. <laughs> an hour and a half on this drill, and he just shredded every – Everyone on it. Um, there's, a, there's, a really, there's a really famous clip of, of Kyrie on the US team. And I don't know if you know this particular clip, but he's just like, he's like gone around his back and through his legs while he's moving at like 100 oh, miles an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Through, 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 through the, like the best players in the NBA. That's and, when he was, that was like his rookie year. Yeah. That wasn't even when he was on Team USA. That was when he was on like the select team, which is the young the young whippersnappers who are going against the actual USA team. Oh, that's what that was. Yeah. 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 That's right. Was, yeah. Well, I mean, he's going through, you know, Kobe Harden, like all these guys just making it look. Yeah. Like his hand, his handle is, is, is something, something else. And his ability to finish and the way he finishes left and right. Like I've never yeah. seen anything like it. He just like unique in that sense. He's, he's um, but to, to answer your question, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. And I, I don't want to speak for him, to be honest. Um, I would say that he was a fit in, when was it, 2016 when they, uh, when they won the championship. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. With everything, it's just finding the right dynamic, whether it's, you know, other teammates, ownership, front office. Um, you know, I've never been in his shoes. I wish I was at one point. Uh, I have Kyrie's. Uh, in fact, I have Kyrie's right here. <laughs> so this is uh, not quite being in his shoes, but I do have it. <laughs> but I, I think it's, I mean, we can go in so many different directions as to why, you know, why didn't it work out in Boston? Um, you know, is it going to work out in Brooklyn? Uh, why didn't he want to stay with LeBron? You know, I, yeah. I wish I could give 
a good answer. I'm not sure I have it though. To be honest. <laughs> well, I mean, like it, there's there's certain amounts of you know maybe he just wanted the ball in his hands more, wanted to be the guy. Uh, he kind of, I mean, that's true. I mean, they won a championship. But like, I mean, maybe yeah. he's just like I, I got it. That's what I wanted in my career. Like a lot of this amazing players, like the classic example, of Charles Barkley, like don't get, you know, a maybe. Ring. Yeah, ring. Yeah, so he's got one. So he's like, well, after this, yeah. I could, I could care less. I, I, and he, he hit the shot to put him in the lead in Game Seven uh, yeah, he, he in did. Golden State. I um, and, you know, I think to, to simplify it, um, you mentioned Curry. I mean, you know, people's legacies are about how many championships have you won. And you just made that point, right? So Barkley will never be on the same status as you know, Michael Jordan, because he didn't win one. Um, you know, Steph has won three of them. Kyrie's won one of them. So when you compare in that sense, that's what, that's the first thing that, that people think about. But, um, you know, I, hopefully he has a long career ahead of him and he stays healthy. And that's another thing is health. Uh, yeah. And, staying for 82 games in the regular season plus the playoffs so yeah that's that's true he, he's um i mean he, he's just such an incredible talent to watch that he could play anywhere and i think he'd still be he'd still be yeah it's everyone would watch him and, and love him wherever he goes yeah there's no it's, question he's he's definitely uh he's definitely entertaining because you just can't predict what he's going to do um <laughs> He's, he's, yeah, it's just everything about his game. He he's kind of got this um. He's got this great uh, ability to to kind of create, and he's he's very creative in the way he plays. Yeah. But he's also he's also under control. So he's he's kind of playing out of kind of taking difficult shots, but also if you've seen him on, on the USA team, like in the one on one drills, I don't know if you were watching this, like against some of the top guys in the NBA. That I. I uh, trying to think it was the I want to say it's the world championships and they showed yeah. the, the USA training camp and they're all doing one-on-ones and he was smoking yeah. everybody like everybody. for fun right. he, he, it was kind of like I think like when the first that redeemed team when he was with Kobe he was like he wasn't quite there yet but now he's like seems to be like the best player on the team almost and right he can just take whoever he wants like he's that right. good it's, right it's incredible. part of that too is uh you know, having a guy like Coach K, who he played for, um, yeah, it was 11 games, but they had preseason, they, you know, they had a full season together, he recruited them, so, like, they had an existing relationship, and that level of trust is important, um, you know, and especially at the international stage like that, so. Yeah, uh, that's true. Yeah. The, the, did he stay then? He was still around. Like he didn't like leave. He stayed and did the full year, even though he's just on the bench. Was that the way it always worked? Yeah. So he he had such a weird injury. Um, it was something like he had an extra bone in his toe, and he hurt it. And at one point, actually, they weren't sure if it was they, they, there was a chance that it was career threatening. So they continue to rehab it, and um, you know one of one of the things about Duke is uh, the hospital and the resources, you know, and uh, you know with the School of Medicine and all that, it's very forward thinking. So you know, thank God he had access to that. But um, he ended up rehabbing to the point where he actually returned for the NCAA tournament. So he came back and played three games because uh we lost to arizona in the sweet 16 got upset um but you know you could tell like he didn't have his full legs under him but he still was just amazing just an incredible player but then that next year so that summer he went number one in the draft and then the following season was the lockout so he actually came back to school and continued to take classes and um, that was my senior year. It would have been his sophomore year. But I would, you know, he would text me, call me, and be like, hey, let's go to the gym. And I would work him out. I wouldn't work him out. I would rebound for him. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but still, some pretty cool, pretty cool memories. Uh, That's uh, crazy. Guy, so. That's good you got to work him out. I mean, you just, just as tip. I mean, that's one of the, the best players of our generation. That's yeah. incredible. 
And there are stretches where he wouldn't miss, Mark. I mean, like 10 just minutes wouldn't. long where he just wouldn't miss. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. He, he he's such a talent, and you can just see it's oozing out of him. Like, he's such a basketball talent. Yeah. He almost, and he kind of – he seems like he's he's just aware of just how good he is now at, the, at this point. Yeah, it'll be yeah. interesting next year once, uh, you know, he, he had a shoulder thing that he was rehabbing, and obviously Kevin Durant with his Achilles. Um, you know, Brooklyn will be worth watching. Yeah, for sure, yeah. Yeah, whenever he's playing, it's worth watching, to be honest. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, there was something else on um oh yeah uh, the uh, the coach cave thing just wanted to see like i wonder if you had any thoughts on why he never coached in the nba or would he ever coach in the nba or do you think he'd always stay yeah well he had an offer uh okay i'm sure he's had more than one offer uh but there was one in like the early 2000s if i remember correctly that he contemplated hard uh and that was with the lakers um, early 2000s so you're talking about Kobe and Shaq are still there 2001 maybe? yeah I can't remember if it was like if Phil Jackson ended up getting the job or if it was at maybe it was in the mid to late 2000s um, I can't remember to be honest in, in terms of the exact time frame mark but uh, I know he contemplated that hard but I just think his just his passion is in the college game and the way he prefers to coach is, is at the collegiate level. Um, and part of that is you're coaching, you know, 18 to 22 year olds. Now the game, the NBA game has gotten younger. Um, so it would be interesting in today's game, but you know, the way he prepares, the way he, the way he uh, goes about every single game. Um, I don't know if it'd be sustainable for 82 games. Uh, <laughs> the amount of film he watches and the amount uh you know i think he likes the recruiting part of the collegiate game um but i know he's had opportunities to go to the next level but i'd say he's built quite a nice legacy for himself <laughs> yeah i mean you kind of want to you almost want to um stay in, in with that he's been there so long it's almost like he's chip committed or even every phrase you want to use like yeah. he's He's yeah. kind of been there so long. It's like, well, I probably should just see out my time here. And yeah, this is and I mean, part of you know the USA opportunity scratched that itch for him too. I mean, that's, that's true too, yeah. an unbelievable opportunity to coach the best of the world for not for eighty-two games, but for a six-week period where it's a sprint. Um, yeah. That's true. in terms of finding a where he's really good is not only his preparation, but uh, the way he can motivate is uncanny. Yeah, that, that's the sense I got. I, I, it's actually interesting. There's another point I had written down about Coach K. As well, was, um, I was watching the Redeem team, and he brought an army sergeant in. And then I think they mentioned in that that he was, he was in the U.S. Army from 6974. Yeah, which is interesting because I know army guys. I know guys from the British Army and just how regimented it is and how how much they took from that in terms of living your life in a very structured way and being prepared for everything and the level of detail that, that they have in their day-to-day -day life and how they kind of bring that to their you know next thing and I straight away could see that almost in in Coach K and I thought well yeah. he's definitely Super taking structured. something from that yeah no question super structured and you know so he he wasn't just a soldier like he went to west point academy which is considered like he played basketball for bobby knight at west point which is considered the best leadership school in the united states so you're going to learn to be the tops you know one of the top soldiers and if not a top soldier the, the top leader of soldiers so in terms of the qualities that he learned i mean a lot of them he attributes back to his time at west point this point so he you know and in terms of structure and regiment uh you should see his practice plan it's to the t i mean it's <laughs> that's what we follow well, do, do, and do you, we, like, do, does he allow? Because I, because I often uh, um, th think about these things around, like you know, when something's very structured, 
you lose a certain element of uh, spontaneity or something like that. You know, like does yeah. he still allow for that, or does he just like rigidly yeah. stick into plans? And no, hundred percent. I mean, he's. Um, yeah, I mean, he, there's definitely the foundation of what he believes in, but I, that's where he's amazing. Is there's there's uh, he allows spontaneity. I mean, he has, he has a great sense of humor. Um, you know, he adapts to the times. I mean, he's he's very with it. Um, and that's the question I've gotten for the last five years, ten years, is whatever. You know, when do you think Coach K will retire, and who's going to be his replacement? It's like. I don't know if you'll ever retire. <laughs> retire. It's, it's strange you brought that up because I actually, so it was one of the questions that I, when I typed in another question up and I just ran and clicked on it. I took down the name Jeff Chapel, but I don't know if that's, that guy is still there, Jeff Chapel. Uh, Jeff, Jeff Capel, he... Um, Capel, sorry. <laughs> yeah, Jeff Capel, uh, he's, uh, he's not there anymore. He's the head coach of Pittsburgh, who's in the same conference as Duke. Um, but he was he a was, uh, very successful coach even before Duke. He played at Duke and then was a head coach, a Division One head coach at 27 years old at Virginia Commonwealth, VCU. 27. At 27. And then I think at 31 or 32, he became the head coach of Oklahoma, Coach Blake Griffin. Wow. Um, then came back to Duke uh, – and was an assistant coach and then is now the head coach at Pittsburgh. That's, that's incredible. 27. <laughs> yeah, not bad, right? How does that happen? <laughs> uh, connections. Yeah. Smarts, luck. Yeah. There's, there's, being the right fit. His dad it, was a coach. Uh, Jeff's, Jeff Capel's dad was a longtime coach at, at the collegiate level. So I think that helps too, you know, just knowing – the right people obviously yeah that's interesting yeah i'm listening to another podcast from a, a an american coach called pat price who's in the irish league for for a number of years and he's okay. he's talking to some uh, some collegiate coaches that coach at, at a high level now and just interesting to hear their journeys and it's very similar like that just their network of people and yeah. they kind of they maybe stood out a little bit and they just kind of worked out some key players that he that they rose up with their star a little bit so there was just a and then a bit of luck and just they were quite good communicators and this right, right. just interesting to hear how these people just kind of navigate oh, yeah. their way up to the top and it can just happen right. by chance it's uh an important part of the industry is who you know um not exactly what you know i mean that's an important part too but who you know is goes a long way <laughs> yeah 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 yeah, but, but sometimes you like these people aren't even intentionally networking. They're just like talking to right. people and they just, they're, maybe they've got some kind of, you know, they, they, people gravitate towards them. They're char charismatic sure. or whatever it is. So yeah. No, it's just interesting, interesting to hear the stories. Yeah. Uh, okay. The, the other thing I wanted to touch on. Uh, so after you left Duke, um, you ended up coming across to Paul's Sport Dream Academy, yeah. which is incredible. Um yeah. So, so the I just wanted to get your perspective there on the overall experience, and then also the the level of player, you know, the level of the players at that age. Maybe in like to, maybe it's unfair to compare them to American players, but it'd be interesting to get your perspective on that for, as yeah. an outsider. And then also, wh what impressed you with them? You know, what were you like? Okay, the basketball level is is really good in this area. And then maybe what you think, like the first thing that stuck out that said, like what's missing versus what you received maybe in the States at that age. Sure. No, it's, first of all, it was uh, one of the best weeks of my life. I mean, it was just, well, just the ability to visit Paul in Ireland. I'd never been. Um, oh, cool. <laughs> and so we, you know, we landed and we went and, uh, well, I landed, we went straight to the pub. So that, that's the first thing. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Which is exactly but, what you should do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had to. I had to have a Guinness uh, in Ireland right away. Um, of course. But no, it was incredible, and you know, just a testament to Paul to being able to put something together, a passion project for him. That's you know, it's not full time for him, um, but to put something together where he has a facility, has a good group of coaches, and he's able to pull 
you know, the elite talent of Ireland into one place and properly coach them. Uh, that, that doesn't happen overnight. And so I know a lot of hard work, but, um, went into that, but it was incredible, Mark. And, uh, the year I went, it was summer of 2015. Okay. So we had, I mentioned, um, maybe it was off air, but we had John Carroll who was entering his sophomore year. He was at Hartford at the time. Okay. So the, the, the year you went over, John was uh, at the camp. He was at the camp, but he was like a counselor, or like, you know, helping coach. Um, okay. Cool. Orla o O'Reilly, who, who ended up, you know, before that played at Binghamton in, in the States. Uh, and then in the camp, Jordan Blount, who was on your, uh, that's right, Jordan. Yeah, I did. Jordan okay. Played at UIC. He was uh, on your podcast earlier. Sean Flood, who just finished up at Longwood. He's coming he's on. on. <laughs> Is he good? Yeah, I, I love him. He uh, he was on my team. Um, Ryan Leonard, who just signed with Eastern Illinois. Uh, we ran a lot of actions for the two of them. Uh, <laughs> and then at that time, I don't think SDA has any uh, women's players anymore. But um, the two sisters, the Power Cassidy sisters. Uh, um, Brona, who just signed with Holy Cross, and then Searsha, who played at uh, UMass Lowell. It's like we had, there was good talent there. Yeah, that's and, incredible. And, you know, at that time, I mean, that's that was five years ago, obviously, which is hard to believe. But uh, my first impression was I'm fired up to, you know, to be able to coach and develop these kids. I had no expectations at all. Um, but the first thing that I noticed is how attentive they were to everything that I had to say, extremely coachable, ask questions, you know, you could tell them to run off, you know, run through a wall and they do it because they want to be coached. And so, um, you know, when you do compare to Americans, that's not always the case nowadays. Um, whether it's because the parents are too involved or, you know, uh, who knows why, but. Um, that was the first thing is they want to be coached. Um, you know, the talent level isn't, it's not as high as it is in the States, but that, you know, that goes without saying, because I think it's behind. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what the exciting thing is, is when you, you know, I've known Paul now for 20 years and you look at when you guys were growing up, you know, there weren't a lot of Irish basketball players playing in the States, playing at the collegiate level. In fact, I'm blanking on his name. I think there was one who played at Davidson. He was the first Irish player. Yeah, they, I found out after there was, there was two guys before him. And I got, I got corrected when I posted on Facebook because there's some older Irish players. There is two before him. Okay. I didn't know about either. So, um, they, uh, yeah. So, but, but, but I think like literally those two guys, and then it was uh, a guy called Michael Bree, who you just mentioned at Davidson, right. who we just right. had on uh, yeah, just recently. Oh, did you? Yeah. So that's yeah. a good one to watch actually. Okay. Um, so he, he was, he was the first one of our generation. There was two guys previous to that. Okay. Um, previous. So I don't want to, I don't want to make sure, I, you know, they're important as well. But my point is that you fast forward, you know, 10 to 15 years later, and you have one, two, three, four, five, six. You have eight people who played collegiately in a camp. And so yeah. it's going to take time. But as long as there are people who are passionate about the sport, who want to grow it, in, in this case in Ireland, it's just going to continue to grow. And it's going to be exponential. And then obviously the opportunity to play you know, in the States will become more available for more kids as long as they you know want to do that and the good thing is is that not everyone i think it was a realization for a lot of kids that okay maybe i'm not good enough to play in the states so their goal was to make their local team or you know to play at whatever level that fits them so it was awesome i loved every second of it if i could do it every year i i would um unfortunately i i haven't been able to do that but um you know, shout out to Paul for putting a passion project together. And unfortunately, the coronavirus is going to uh, probably sh not make it happen this year. But um, it was an incredible week and I loved every second of it. That's that's really good to hear that you had such a good experience. Um, 
certainly when I've heard about Paul doing it, and I've said this to Paul as well, um, the fact that he did it himself, took the initiative to go and do that was remarkable, I thought, especially given you know, he had such a good uh, experience. And I guess he, maybe his thoughts were that he was lucky enough to have done it himself. And obviously there was a lot of talent there as well. Right. Uh, but that he wanted other people to experience what he had experienced perhaps and and, and there's there is there is kids in Ireland that want to play basketball at a higher level and, and they maybe don't get the exposure that that they could get if there was a little bit more of a as he called it like a shop window um the fact that he kind of put that in place himself was so impressive i thought yeah you know? pretty pretty cool i mean that's go, goes to show how you know how much he wants to give back to Ireland basketball, um, just mm-hmm. to make it better. So it's awesome. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a great effort by him. Yeah, so it just props again to Paul. Um, okay, I still can't get any dirt on him. I'm gonna someday I'll find something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, uh, yeah, there's probably uh, maybe over, over a few pints we'll um, we'll be able to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully if the camp goes on again, if you ever get to go over. We'll uh, we'll meet up and we'll yeah that'd be awesome. Yeah. Oh, another guy too, Paul Keller. I actually met him. He came and worked at Duke basketball camp. Ah, so cool. I knew him coming into SDA uh, 2015. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. It's just another example of how small the the basketball world the is. Basketball That's... world truly is. It's unbelievable. That's crazy. Um, That's cool. So. Uh, the next question was then, uh, so what is it you do now? Because uh, that was the other one Paul said to, to bring up. Yeah. Um, so I work for a, it's a software company based in Durham, North Carolina. And it's a, it's basically a mobile app uh, where we help collegiate athletics and professional athletics teams basically everything off the field or off the court for them, we help manage. So basically it's a communication operations platform. So all okay. the communication, all the scheduling, all the uh, travel, all the paperwork that is required to run a program can be streamlined in one place. And the main thing is for the athletes, rather than going to so many different, you know, different platforms, it's all streamlined through one. Mm-hmm. So I work primarily in the collegiate level and because I have an operations background with Duke basketball, it's something that I can talk about all day. <laughs> really too. You know, it's, it's not like the X's and O's, but it's a very important part of what we do. But, um, you know, we're working with half of the NBA teams, uh, about 18 NFL teams. Um, we work with over a hundred collegiate athletic departments but then we also work in the english premier league so liverpool arsenal chelsea they're all operating communicating on our platform it's called teamworks teamworks yeah Uh, i feel like i've heard of it i actually work in tech Uh, Uh, so so shamefully i should know your product yeah (laughs) well i i we're still early in in europe but um okay but uh, yeah, we've we've had pretty good success in in the EPL so far. Knock on wood. Cool. Yeah, Actually, it's been fun. I've been there for four years, and um, it, it's a different way of staying involved with sports. However, I think it's a very uh, growing, you know, part of of uh, athletics. So I think you've got my dream job: tech and tech and sports <laughs> combined <laughs> into one. Uh, yeah, I work for a company called Currency Fair, the currency exchange. Not as okay. exciting. Not as exciting as sport. Um, I, still very needed, especially right now. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. Well, I won't get into it. <laughs> Put people to sleep. Um, the okay. I, I had a few questions on. Um, that, that's a really interesting job, by the way. Um, I'd, I'd yeah. actually like to hear more about that. I might check out sure. the app as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Please do. Uh, okay, so just kind of finish off because we just go nearly an hour now but uh, a couple of questions at the last dance you said you were watching that oh yeah I'm, yeah i'm probably gonna rewatch it to be honest <laughs> yeah yeah i had a really interesting because i had i was actually doing an episode last night and i was talking to uh, a guy who played for gb uh for great britain basketball team uh but he was american his parents were were um 
for British. And I just asked him a few questions on it, and he has an interesting perspective. I just wanted to get your thoughts on it. Um, oh, there's a few here. So this uh, seventh championship chat that was coming from Michael, um, do you think that would have been possible given, I think the guy's point last night was like Scotty Pippen wouldn't have gone, stayed ever given his contract, that that would never have happened? What do you think about that? <laughs> Uh, if Scotty wasn't there, I think it would have been hard. However, right, Michael was staying. <laughs> Scotty would have stayed. Scottie yeah, that's that's what Michael says. Actually, yeah, and that's hard to argue against because he he's such a. If Jordan had said that he was going to stay, there are so many moving parts too. Like you had to keep Phil Jackson. Yeah. That's true. I think Rodman, you had to keep him. Um, he's a liability. He's liable to do anything. Yeah. Oof. Uh, and then Steve Kerr. Steve, you know that Steve Kerr went to San Antonio the next year and won the championship in '99. So if you won four, right. <laughs> God, yeah. How many has he got now? It's because he's got a couple with as, Golden State. As a as a player and a coach, he has a combined eight. He has three with Golden State, and then he won. Wow. He won two with San Antonio. I as forgot about. I forgot about the two with San Antonio. Was that with the Duncan? Because that was Duncan's rookie year, was it? And then it was Duncan's his... either rookie or second year, but that was like at the end of David Robinson's David career. Robinson's career, yeah. Who I used to love, David Robinson. Oh, um, yeah. Amazing player. That's interesting. I just forgot about Steve Carr's eight. Yeah. Yeah, because. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty good winner, huh? That's crazy. And then he. he Possibly a completely different trajectory if that team had stayed together. He wouldn't have went to San Antonio. And yeah, men but men I, of you, I mean, I would, I like, I would like Michael Jordan's chances, but uh, who knows? I mean, yeah, you know, it's just amazing to think though that he retired after that. I know he came back with the Wizards like two or three years later. Like he was done at like age thirty-five, and he still had plenty of left in the gas tank. That's true, actually, yeah. He probably just – yeah, that's true. It's incredible to think that he retired the first time, even. But, I mean, you can kind of see the pressures that were on him. Right. He just – he was – that That was what was really interesting about the documentary was it really started to show the, the pressure he was under. You know, he, I think that it all came to kind of like a microcosm of his life. was like was, he was just sitting in the hotel by himself, curled up on the couch, not wanting to go outside because of the public so attention footage some of, some of the footage was just uh, you know it was incredible um and that was one that that hit me pretty hard i was like damn you just don't think of, you don't think about his normal life mm. you know? his day-to-day -day. having to stay holed up in a hotel and knowing that whenever he opens his hotel door it's gonna be mayhem <laughs> yeah it's literally mayhem yeah it, it's almost like the beatles or something pretty <laughs> much like he's just going to be like he's not going to live a normal life again it just sounds like right. so you can see why he just wanted some time away from the spotlight that kind of makes no sense no okay uh so you, yeah i had a point here around does does this documentary kind of push any claims around the lbj is considered like a goal the goal but i, I mean i don't know if that's a well held belief with any hundreds. I mean I think I, there's an yeah. intention behind making this documentary because That's interesting, yeah. yeah. Michael Jordan was very involved, like behind the production. He had his hands on it. We were just saying that yesterday. So um I think there's some intent behind let's produce this now. <laughs> and, oh, oh! There's a coronavirus. Oh, no one's watching sports. Well, rather than June, let's move it up to April so everyone in the world watches it. Um, <laughs> that's a really interesting point. I never thought about that at all. But that, but there. I mean, listen. It it confirms that he's the greatest. Like he, there's no question. LeBron is maybe the best in terms of just physical basketball like attributes he's probably the best like six eight beast can do everything yeah 
Yeah. But the greatest is Mike. The greatest is Mike, yeah. Hey, I think it comes down to that. I don't mean that people talk about the gene. I don't necessarily just have a psychology degree. I don't think it's just genetic. I think it's definitely something he's kind of developed and nurtured or whatever yeah, um, through his environment. But um, not to say that he wasn't genetically gifted as well, but like, you know what I mean? I think he's he's definitely just developed this drive, which started from a young age. And, and But it's just his his will to win. And like you can see, even when he t- turns the conversation to basketball now, he still bothers him, you know, like, and and it still gets him, you know. Like, you can see he's he's reliving the emotion when he talks about it. Like he's yeah. like, he, a viral he, clip of yeah, the end of that episode where he's moved to tears. It's unbelievable to defend the way he was as a player yeah. because that's what it took for him to get there to win, and he he doesn't. Like if someone doesn't understand that, then that almost he's defending his. It sounds like he's right. defending his, his right. kind of, which is yeah. incredible. That's, that's, no, that's yeah, it's interesting. It is an interesting thing, and you would know more than me because you studied it uh, in terms of the psychology um, of it. But you know the 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 trait of um, the will to win or like competitive drive. I think a lot of that, obviously, and based on the documentary, was nurtured at a young age. Um, but yeah. still, um, there's no one better. There's no one better in that sense. There's no one that is greater than him. Maybe Tom Brady, if, you know, with football. Uh, you would think he's a, he's a, yeah. I mean, he's, from what I, I mean, he's won a lot. So, just in that sense. Oh, from a winning point of view, yeah. Yeah, he's still playing at 42 years old in a very, very physical sport. So, The, the uh, only thing about Jordan that I found amazing was the way he kind of transcended the sport. And I know that people use that term, but like he really did like uh, what he did with, uh, with basketball. Certainly at the time he brought, uh, actually it was David Stern said it really well in the documentary, like he brought the NBA to another level. Like he, he propelled it onto the world stage in, in, a, in a way that like, let's say the NFL never I mean, not to say that that's now kind of got gone global too, but the basketball is now no, basketball global. I mean, it's Spain. Yeah, uh, football. American football will never be the global presence that yeah. Michael Jordan basketball has. Yeah, it, it's almost like what McGregor has kind of done with the UFC. Like it's just yeah. he's he's that star that just took the the sport to a stratospheric level. And everybody yeah. knows who that person is. That that was Michael. So no the fact that he was that um, amazing and just makes him the greatest as well. If you know what I mean? Right. No, very true. Very true. You know, and there was so much, so many things. Like he just, yeah, he's he's an absolute icon. So there. and they, you know, so many people talk about it, but those '92 Olympics is, you know, seeing Mike and the Dream Team, but seeing Mike at an international stage inspired so many kids overseas, whatever country you're from, to play. Just pick up a ball and play. Um, and now, you know, you made the point earlier, look at the NBA now. Look at Luka Doncic and what he's doing and the Dirk Nowitzki's of the world and Steve Nash and, like, all these guys that grew up idolizing Jordan, you know, yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah, no, just just uh, he he took the hype to a new level. Like everybody, when he left the game, I mean, probably the next guy was Vince, and you know, he was just maybe that was, you know, he was the next guy that people were like, okay, we can watch him. Kobe, I suppose as well. But like right. there was the, just the the level of hype around what Jordan brought to the game was it was insane. It was incredible that we had him in our in our generation. Um, to, yeah, I kind of covered that he, he still looks a bit chippy after all these years. But I think, as you say, when it comes to basketball, he's just cutthroat about it. I'm sure if you talk to him about like something else, he'd be completely relaxed and very chill. Sure. Yeah, but if it's anything that has any ounce of competition in it, good luck. <laughs> yeah, look, yeah, I remember reading one of his books when I was younger, and he said uh, he played the assistant coach in a game of pool and <laughs> lost to him. And then didn't talk to him for the rest of the trip, the road trip or something like that. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, this guy's yeah. terrible. And I, I was pretty competitive when I was younger, but I wasn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> I would still talk to him. Yeah, he, apparently, there's probably so many different stories of him competitively. Now it's on the golf course. 
Yeah. yeah. Apparently, <laughs> 36 goals a day. <laughs> oh, really? I didn't know that. Because yeah. he was a golf nut back in the day. Like, that's what he would do. Yeah, now, that's time. all he wants to do is just play golf. And, uh, he, you know, he likes his cigars. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I saw Phil Jackson with a lot of cigars in the clips. And I was like, did he get that from Phil Jackson? Did he really talk about that? Who knows? Uh, I don't know. Uh, very stylish. <laughs> yeah, um, so this, oh, this is one. Um, did you see any similarities? Because uh, Coach K, this is the, the final question I had because I thought it'd be interesting. Any similarities between Coach K and like MJ in terms of like perfectionism, or did you would just would you ever say there was any similarities? Or yeah, I, I mean, I, just from seeing Michael Jordan from afar, um, but just the will to win. I mean that drives Coach K. And I think it's two things. It's the will to win and um, the passion and the fire of the game uh, leading him to prepare. Just the level of preparation for the battle is unbelievable. And it doesn't matter who we're playing against. We're preparing the same way, and okay, it I, I think for the greats, I mean that's that's where those kind of intangibles are just taken to new heights. Um, so just from seeing from afar, I don't, you know, I'll put it this way, Mark. When we we're at Duke, we didn't lose a lot, and whenever we did, it was a twenty-four hour funeral. It's okay. You walk around and it's somber and it sucks. And, uh, you know, so just that alone, when the leader has that, sets that tone where you're expected to win. And if you don't win, we're going to make sure that we prepare to the best of our ability and we'll poke holes in it afterwards. But I think those two things are what kind of stood out to me when, you know, you asked that question. Um, so I think the competitive drive and the will to win, and then also the, just the level of preparation that is required to reach that level. And, and clearly he's, he's found that that preparation has, has given him success. So he'll repeat that then. Like that's 100%. obviously working. Yeah. hundred percent. And if that gets disrupted, then there's no chance. And I think, Going back to a previous question, when will Coach K retire? It's whenever he doesn't have that passion to prepare, which ain't going away anytime soon. Right, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like you say, it's kind of – I always say it's like guys when they – one of the things I've noticed here is um, coming back home um, to Ireland, you know, younger players, and you know, everyone's guilty of this when they're younger, but um, when, when they don't have, let's say uh, – college players or maybe a professional league over here for them to necessarily model their game on or the way they practice on. Uh, sometimes you'll see them come into games and they'll come out and they'll go, oh, I just had a bad game. And in my head, um, just having played at a little bit of a higher level, um, fortunate enough to have that experience, uh, the preparation for those players was, as you say, it, it gets becomes more and more and you start to see the effort that they've put in. Right. And you realize that they don't go into games and, and just expect them to maybe play well. Maybe yeah. I just I just hit some shots tonight. Is a lot of times you'll hear this sentiment. And as an older player who's experienced, you know, seen players play at a higher level, it's it's not necessarily that they're going in and they had a bad game. And you can have bad games, but if you if you're doing most of your work, the the probability that you're going to have a good game over and over again just increases much increases yeah. yeah so much higher so i mean if you do all the prep you can and, and you've done all your you got your shots up and you didn't have a bad game and you can live with it but um i think sometimes guys think that they, it's just a it was a bad night for them it's actually yeah. like well you just didn't snap, snap your finger and you're supposed to have a good game no it's it's like it's like it an exam right it's like if you're going to an exam you haven't done your study your chances are you're going to fail yeah. the exam it's the yeah. same thing yeah no question so, so preparation in every aspect. I think that's a, it's a good message for younger players, for, especially for sport, because I just, uh, particularly in Ireland, sometimes there's not a lot of thought put into that preparation. And 
Right. The more you can do before the game, whether it's just getting sleep or whether it's just eating well or, or, or lifting well. or whatever it is. Yeah. No question. Mm. Yeah. And, and the preparation is, is uh, really driven by your will to win and like the will to be as good as possible. So you feed off each other in a way. Yeah, I think sometimes it, as a younger player, that you might not tie those two together. You, um, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, and then w once you do it and you see the success, you'll you'll start to prepare more and more. Yeah. But uh, it's just a good one for younger players who sometimes might go in and think, "Well, why am I not playing well?" It's just because you haven't maybe put enough prep in, or it's just to tie those two things together. Right. Okay. Uh, the oh, I had one more question about Paul, but you sure. kind of covered it off. I was trying to find something annoying to put Paul did, but. <laughs> not a lot of me. He's a he's a he's a good he's a good lad. He's a I love him, man. He's he's a brother to me. So annoying awesome. though. I could probably poke holes. <laughs> but we'll we'll get it the next time when you come over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no doubt. No That's doubt. Awesome. All right. Well look, it's it's we've gone for an hour ten, so like probably don't want to hold you up too much. Um Listen, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Uh, really really appreciate, it. appreciate it. And uh, best of luck with the, the kid um, yeah, thanks. coming up. Hopefully thanks. you don't have to run out anytime soon. But uh, Yeah, hopefully not. We got uh, four days till the due date. So okay, every time, everything's packed up, ready to go. Um, but yeah, Mark, this was a blast. And appreciate you uh, inviting me on. Um, a lot of fun and best of luck moving forward. I'll certainly be a, be a subscriber and listener. Awesome. Thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. Good thing. All right. Cheers, buddy. All right. Cheers. Take care. Cheers.